name we pray. Amen. word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should, we do to, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered him a sacrifice and made vows to him. Good morning, church family. Glad you guys are here this morning with us. Today we're kicking off and launching a four-week series through a uh, short four-chapter book called Jonah. And throughout this series, we're going to witness God's great love and his relentless pursuit of sinful people. Praise God. From renegade cities to rebellious prophets to me to you, nobody's beyond God's reach. Jonah is uh, part of a group often referred to as the 12. No, not that 12. It's a different 12. In fact, this book takes place approximately 800 years before the disciples, so it's a different 12. See, these 12 are known as the minor prophets. Now, these 12 books, they were written when the people of Judah and the people of Israel were divided, right? They're, they're falling away from God, and they're suffering the consequences of their disobedience, right? And then they're repenting, and they're receiving forgiveness and restoration, right, through that repentance. So this is the cycle that they're living in. Now, if you're trying to find Jonah in your Bible, it can be a bit tricky. Uh, it's right next to Obadiah. Did that, did that help? Yeah. Uh, the table of contents is always a good place to go. If, if, if you need help finding something, you can look up the page. Um, if pride is an issue for you and you don't want to look up the page number, then just turn to Matthew, then go left and go through the minor prophets and you'll eventually, you got to go slow. If a page sticks, you'll miss it, but eventually you'll run into this four chapter book called Jonah. You'll pass by a bunch of names that sound like they could easily be included in the Star Wars universe. You got like Obadiah, Jonah, Obi-Wan, um, Micah, Ahsoka, Zephaniah, Anakin, Micah, you know what I mean? Like we can form a resistance here. You with me? I'm sorry. Sometimes the Star Wars nerd just comes out. You don't have to deal with it. But the book of Jonah, it's small, but man, it packs a punch. It's feisty. Okay? For starters, it's famous. 
right? You could ask pretty much anybody, I'm sure, if we did a, a tally in here, and those of you watching online at home, uh, you'd know what the story is. They'd, they'd, they'd probably be like, yeah, this is about some dude getting swallowed up by a big fish. But there's so much more to it than a man and a giant fish. In fact, Jonah also uh, packs a punch because it's surrounded by quite a bit of controversy. It's a pretty controversial book. There are uh, questions about historical accuracy that come into play. Uh, there are debates about genre. And essentially, there is um, a, a lot of disagreement on how we should read this book, how we should interpret this, these four chapters. And I just want to say it up front, like, safe place. We might not agree on everything, okay? But could we just, like, could we try something? Could we try to disagree better in the church? You think we could try to do that? Could we disagree with maybe, I don't know, like some gentleness, maybe some love? Could we disagree while maintaining the unity that our Lord and Savior prayed that we would have? It's incredibly arrogant to think that, you know, your opinion is the right one, especially on topics that have been debated for centuries, right? But you, you nailed it down. You got this. I'm all about an open discussion. I like to talk things through, and we don't always have to agree. But if you have to be right all the time, can I just say, you're part of the problem, okay? You are. Like, whether it's your view of the end times or your interpretation of a literary work like Jonah, I assure you, the intention, the intention of the author here was not to divide Christ's church. So with that on our hearts, let's look at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, most people know that Jonah tells God no, right? And literally jets off and runs the opposite direction from Nineveh and then he's swallowed up by a big fish. Now, this is where people get hung up. Folks get stuck here. Well, this can't be true. Right? Like, how, how can this be true? How is this possible? He survived in a fish for three days? That's got to be a myth, Josh. See, throughout this series, please try not to forget that this is a story about God, not some majestic, magnificent, oversized catfish. It's about God. Is it really that hard to believe? In Genesis 1, it says that um, God said, let there be light, and what happened? There was light, right? Like, God can speak light into existence, but he can't sustain a man and a fish for three days? Really? Like, there are harder things to believe in the Bible than Jonah, right? How about this? The virgin, Matthew 1, verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I'm sorry, a virgin conceived? I checked how many times this has happened in history. This was it. <laughs> this is it. She's with baby, but she was never with a man. Like if I had a list of the most difficult things to believe, Jonah is hardly on that list. How about Luke 24? He is not here. Well, where'd he go? He's risen. What? Like, he raises the dead. He also raises from the dead. Oh, and not just that, but he offers eternal life to everyone who believes in him. So he will raise the dead. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die, he says. So do you see why it's a bit silly to believe all that, but then you pick up Jonah and you say, well, this is impossible. How, how could this happen? God created the physical world, folks, with words. You get that, right? With words. If he can do that, I think he can do this. I think he can pull it off, you think? See, don't be so anxious to excuse God from working in his creation. It's his, after all. Like, we don't need to explain the unexplainable to everyone that asks. We don't need to give a reason for the majestic or the unimaginable. We don't have to have reasons for those things. All we have to do is point to our living and active God who still works in the world today. And we can shine light on the fact that, hey, yeah, it's really cool that God worked in a fish, you know, a really long time ago, but praise God that he worked through a baby boy back in, you know, Bethlehem. Like, we can celebrate that. 
Now, some people, they'll say, okay, but Josh, you know, maybe it's supposed to be read as a parable. Well, okay, but the problem with that is it's just not written that way, right? Like the names, the dates, the details, way too much detail for a parable. See, it's written in the genre of history. It says Jonah, the son of Amittai, not, you know, once upon a time there was a guy named Jonah. Not to mention Jonah gets a shout out in 2 Kings. He gets, a, he gets a shout out in 2 Kings, giving even more historical weight to the book of Jonah. And I think the most convincing argument, folks, for it being a historical account is that Jesus thought of it as a historical event. Luke 11, Jesus says, For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Remember? Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And look at, verse, look at verse 32. This is good. It says, The people of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus clearly didn't think of Jonah as some, like, creative writing piece. And I feel like he would know. Now, a couple things about Nineveh. It was a great city, but it was a wicked city. Places messed up. And you might be thinking, well, Josh, Jonah didn't say anything about Nineveh being wicked. And you're right, good eye. But Nahum did. Nahum says, from you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. Folks, Nineveh was guilty. They exploited the most vulnerable among them. They, um, they showed cruelty in war. There was adultery, prostitution, witchcraft, you name it. Nineveh had it. In fact, look at Nahum chapter 3. It says, woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. So Nineveh's evil. Now, as for the size of Nineveh, Jonah says that it took three days to walk from one side to the other. Now, historians say that you can actually ride three chariots side by side on top of the walls of Nineveh. So these are big walls, amazing architecture. In fact, Nineveh, was on the rise, right? It was gaining notoriety. It was well on its way. In fact, within 50 years would become capital of the entire empire, the entire Assyrian empire. But the Ninevites, they were crazy and they were easily among the top cruelest people in the ancient world. Uh, they, in fact, they told stories. They were proud of it. They told stories about their cruelty when they conquered a city, they would skin alive the men, women, and children and spread their skins over the city walls. And then they would bury them alive, leaving just their head exposed, and they would pull out their tongues and just watch as they slowly died of thirst. They would rape the women and kill them, and they even boasted about raping and killing young girls. When they would leave the city, they would cut off everyone's head and leave a sign that read, this is what happens when you mess with Assyrians. These folks are monsters. Be honest. If we set up a missions trip to the Assyrian Empire, would you sign up? I mean, we have a hard time getting people to go to Mexico to build a house, you know, or, or go to Israel, right, to, to see the Holy Land or whatever it is, right? But these monsters are who Jonah was asked to preach against. They're monsters. Now, I want to be really clear. Jonah wasn't afraid to die. That's not what's going on. He just had other plans for them. He wasn't afraid to die. Jonah just thought they should receive justice, not mercy. In fact, in chapter 3, Jonah says that the reason he didn't want to go preach is because he was afraid that it would work. <laughs> he was afraid they'd repent and that God would forgive them. Jonah, he grew up hating these people. He's heard about their crimes against humanity and their cruelty against these young, young girls. And he heard about all these stories over the years. So can you really blame him for not wanting to preach to them? Really? See, here's the thing with Jonah and us and how we relate to Jonah. We can see right through Jonah. And we don't like what we see. But see, I think we're hard on Jonah because it reminds us of ourselves. That's why I think Jonah is, he's fearful, he's selfish, he's spiteful, he's proud, just like you and me. Jonah's simply doing what many of us are guilty of, aren't we? 
Just like Jonah, we respond to the sins of others with some sin of our own. We do this all the time, right? Well, they did this, so this means that I don't need to serve them. I don't need to love them. We do this, right? Well, they did this, so that means I don't need to forgive them. They went too far. So we excuse our mission based on the behaviors of others. We do it all the time. So we want to pick on Jonah here, but aren't we guilty of this, all of us? See, I love what Jesus says in Luke 6. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Like Jesus tells us, just not, not to, just to love those who love us, but to love those who hate us, those who seek to harm us and do wrong. So your agenda might be revenge. Your agenda, you might have some bitterness in you stored up, but when God's ready to show mercy, you need to let that stuff go. Because Jesus says, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Truth is, people will come into your life that will test you as a believer. Amen? They'll test your ability to forgive they will. They will, they will. they will exhaust your capacity for mercy, and they will break down your levels of compassion. But we must understand that we are not the ones. We are not the ones who decide who receives mercy and who doesn't. We're not. When God says go, we got to go. We go. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. I don't, I'm not sure why the word disobedience is used so often to describe verse 3. It is disobedient, but it's so much more than that. Like, this isn't just an unwillingness to do what God asked. This is like a complete dismissal of God entirely. I'm going to do things my way. Right? I'm going to live my life how I want to live my life. I'm going to do me. Right? I, I know my truth. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's my life. It's now or never. Right? We're like, let's go. Bon Jovi gets it. J Jonah's done. He's walking away from it all. He's like, peace. But hold on, Jonah. You were made to be a prophet. Right? He was built for this life. That was his purpose, and he's turning his back on it, walking away. Parents, do you remember when they were toddlers? You remember? Yeah, the little baby comes out, right? Starts out so cute, right? Once they wipe it off and stuff, right? They're like, starts off all cute, and, and they're never going to do anything wrong, right? And then they just turn evil on you. It happens so fast, right? When, when our kids were toddlers, if, if they didn't like something that we instructed them to do, they just kind of fold their arms, you know, sit down and say no. Now, they only did it a couple times because they didn't like what came next, right? But look, this, <laughs> this isn't like Jonah's just folding his arms, you know, saying no to the mission. No, God, give me another mission. Anything but that. I'll wait. Come on. No. He's running from God. He doesn't want anything to do with him. Tarshish was like 1,500 miles from Nineveh. I'll show you your mission. Jonah's like, peace out. I'm done with this. I'm out. But here's the thing. Jonah didn't have a track record of rebellion. This is not the huge for him, right? In fact, uh, the book of 2 Kings tells us that Jonah was like, he was a legit prophet. He was very successful in ministry. He's, he's like the Vodi Bacham of, of, of Israel, right? Like, like the, the Billy Graham of Israel. This dude's skilled. He's gifted. But the truth is, I don't care how close you claim you are to God. If you're saying no to him, you've never been further away. Man, folks, we love to measure ourselves by completely meaningless metrics. We're good at it. Well, I come to church every week, and I volunteer in the youth ministry, and, and I do this, I do that. I'm, I'm saying yes to God. Okay, then let me ask you this. Do you consider this your church home? Do you consider this your family? Then do you consider it part of your duty to help us make sure we meet our financial goals too? Do you? 
We have family meetings every year where we determine our goals. We lay them before you. We say, this is what we're doing. Have you ever asked your pastor or an elder how we're doing with those goals and how you can help? See, some of us, we're so excited to say yes to God on certain things. We're like, yeah, let's do that. But the second he reaches for our wallets, we're on the next ship to Tarshish. (laughs) If Jesus got to go over your finances with you, what do you think he would say? What area of your life are you saying no to God in? Huh? Huh? What area of your life is off limits to the one that made you? From our perspective, really, though, who's the bad guy in this story? Who's the the fool? Who's like the jacked up person? It's not the heathen sailors. In fact, Jonah makes them look good. Like, they're terrified when they find out he's running from Yahweh. They're like, "You, you did what? They're smarter than him? He even makes the Ninevites look good. Those nasty people with sex, drugs, rock and roll in the city that never sleeps. He even makes the fish look good. Who's the antagonist? Who's the bad guy? Who's the sinner in this book? It's the religious man. It's the preacher. Man. Folks, like sin is so much more than just breaking the rules. It's so much bigger than that. It's building your life on the wrong foundation. You can be moral and you can follow every rule in the book. You can even lead a church to follow every rule in the book. But all the while, you can be creating for yourself an identity apart from God and it will blow up in your face. Notice how the ship is ready. Did you see that? It's all packed up, waiting in port. How convenient, right? In our flawed series a few weeks ago, I was talking about Gideon and the fleece test. You remember? If not, you can go look on YouTube or the mobile app. We were talking about the fleece test, and it was good stuff. Have you ever encountered Christians that believe everything's a sign? They're just kind of walking around with their head up, looking in the clouds all day. Now, you're probably looking at that ship being ready, saying to themselves, see, God's in this. I'm doing the right thing. Nope, you're not. Can we just be real? Satan can open doors too. It's sad that we don't talk about this more in church. We don't talk about the enemy enough. Like Satan can lay traps all over the place. He can lay a trap in front of the door God opened for you. You just got to leap over. That's the way through. Listen to me. If you want to run from God, Satan will make sure there's a ship waiting for you in Tarshish. All aboard. Verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Don't miss this, folks. See, Jonah's rebellion is no longer just between him and God. It's not. Now he's endangered a whole crew. He's put them all in danger. The running man has now cost these unsuspected sailors their precious goods and he's put their lives in danger. See, rarely does our sin just sort of drop off after we're done with it. See, more often than not, it's sort of just dragging along behind us, going side to side, just wreaking all kinds of damage. Our sin can be devastating for the people in our lives. Our spouse, our kids, our family, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors. And I just don't, I don't think we own this enough as Christians. We're so concerned with our image. We're so concerned with the way people look at us, our reputation, that rarely do we see believers humble themselves, stop, turn around, and actually take note of the damage of their sin and deal with the people that they left behind. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. How crazy is this? <laughs> the pagan sailors are having a prayer meeting up top, and the prophet of God is down below. He's been given a message from God, and he's down below taking a nap. Like, don't ignore your sin, folks. You need to wage war on it. Let me ask you this. Are the people around you doing more to fight your sin than you are? 
Do they seem to care more about the damage your sin has on you than you do? Because, folks, it starts with a small disobedience, but it leads to disaster. I'm telling you, sin isn't something you can ignore. It's like a cancer. The thing will spread. If you, don't, if you don't turn from your sin now, then it goes from just a weak moment where you looked at porn to a marriage lacking intimacy in a home that's on the brink. Like the progression of sin, it is real. It is devastating. Unchecked anger turns into bitterness and resentment and breaks relationships. Unchecked addiction turns into this spiral of unhealthy habits that wreck all of your relationships. Your sin, listen to me, your sin won't stay in Joppa where it started. It'll follow you. I don't care how far you sail. Man, folks, you got to deal with your sin now. Right now. The captain went to him and said, how can you, how can you not deal with this? How can you sleep right now? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice so that we will not perish. I love that. The captain's like, hey, Jonah, um, we've tried to call on every God we know of. We have flipped through the phone book. We've hit every number, every address. We've done everything we can. Could you just please wake up and call yours? Because our God seems powerless. Our God seems powerless. Call on yours. This is our last ditch effort right here. The irony here is a, hard to miss. <laughs> like the pagan sailors tossing up prayers like crazy. Remember Elijah on the mountain, right? Maybe they're sleeping. Pray a little louder. Maybe your gods went on vacation. Well, you know who is sleeping? Jonah. See, he knows that his God can do it, but he's not asking him to. Folks, imagine what believers think of you when they hear you say that God can do amazing things, but then they watch as you never ask him to. Verse 7, the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. <laughs> I just picture Jonah, right, working this moment through in his head like, these these guys are idiots, right? Like this is what the stupid sailors are going to rely on some dumb superstitious method to identify who's responsible. <laughs> I'll wait as they punish the wrong guy. This is ridiculous. I love this, right? And then God intervenes in this ridiculous superstitious method and reveals the truth. You can't hide, folks. You can't run. Just stop. God reveals that Jonah is the problem. Look, so they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? Right? They're grilling him. Where is your, what's your country? From what people are you from? So they grill Jonah, and he spills the beans. But look at this. He gives his, look at this. He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. You worship the Lord? Come on, Jonah. Really? I'm sorry, maybe, maybe I'm a little slow. You might say you worship the Lord, but your life is telling another story, buddy. So, so wait, Jonah, the, the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, he knows all things, he is all powerful, he can see all things. How can you run from something that sees and knows all things? Well, I mean, the answer to that question is pretty simple, right? Like you can't. You can't physically run from God. When Nolan was a, was a baby, he... Um, he used to think that if he would cover his face, his eyes, that it actually made him invisible. So it was really cute, and then it got really old, right? Because then you had to kind of go along with it. But he just covered his, like, think he's invisible. You can't hide from God. You can't run from God. All you're going to end up looking like is, like, what you can do is you can build your life and your identity on everything but God. That's what Jonah's doing. He's starting to build his own thing. 
He's saying all the right things still, but his life isn't confirming his testimony. You know what he sounds like? He sounds like an American Christian in 2023. I'm an American. I'm a Christian. I worship the Lord. Meanwhile, they don't invest in their church family. None of their time, skill, or money goes to help others, just themselves. They hop from place to place when their feelings get hurt or when, the, when they don't like the preaching anymore, and they've never shared the gospel with a single soul. Right. Who do you worship? Write this one down. There's probably not much from this sermon that will be memorable, but this deserves some thought this week. Folks, you cannot worship God while you're running from him. You can't surrender to God when you're saying no to him. You just can't. You can't say you believe in God. You can't say you worship God if you don't do what he says. And that's not me saying that. That's Jesus. He says, I know, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. How do we know we know him? If we keep his commands. To those who say, I know him, but do not do what he commands are liars. And the truth is not in them. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we're in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. I tell myself this all the time. The best thing I can do for my marriage is obey God. The best thing I can do for my kids is obey God. The best thing that I can do for this church is obey God. The best thing I can do for the staff members of this church is obey God. God, Doug, we can't run away from God yet seek his love at the same time. Have you ever seen Four Christmases? Yeah? Funny movie. I'm starting to get nostalgic. I'm, I'm, I'm like counting down the days. I think it's because I skipped Christmas. I didn't skip Christmas, but we didn't put up decorations last year, so I'm like all like hyped for the fall. And I think I saw 79 degrees on the weather the other day, and I'm like, it's happening. So I was thinking about all the Christmas movies, right? And, and remember uh, in Four Christmases, remember when they're like arguing in the car on their way back from his dad's house? You remember this conversation? And she says, she says, look, I just want to know that if we're in a time of crisis, like if we're in a plane crash, I just want to know that you'd put my mask on first. And he responds while saying, well, I wouldn't, and the FAA wouldn't want me to either. Because if I put your mask on, then I'm not breathing, and now she's got to help me, and then they're not breathing, and then everybody's dying, and the whole thing falls apart. Like, if you aren't getting spiritual oxygen first, you won't be able to help anyone around you. You won't. If you're running from him instead of looking for ways to connect with him and know him and fellowship with him, you, listen to me, you won't be the only one getting hit by the waves. The greatest gift you can give those around you is your best effort at Christ-likeness. It's the greatest gift you can give your wife, your kids, your grandkids, your family, your spouse. Like, if your kids are materialistic, maybe it's because you are. You find it painful to be generous and you expect them not to. Like, if God's not a priority for you, how can he show up in your marriage? How can he reshape your relationships? How can, he, how can you expect your kids to have him first in their life when they don't even see him in your top 10? Do as I say, right? Not as I do. But that's not how discipleship works. You can't lead someone where you're unwilling to go yourself. Verse 10, this terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. Look at this, the sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? I know some of you come in here with this, so you need to hear this. This isn't the first time God used a storm to help someone redirect, and it won't be the last. God sends storms to get our attention. That's what he does. In fact, there are two ways that God humbles us. You'll either be humbled by his word or you'll be humbled by his waves. Those are his two methods. Some of us, praise God. Some of us, we can read the word of God. We can read about the God of the cosmos and find humility immediately. We're just like, boom. And that's beautiful. And you should praise God for that. That's a gift. But many of us 
are like Jonah. And we take a little bit more of a, we require a little bit more of a hands-on approach. So they asked Jonah, what should we do? He says, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. This is on me. I know it's my fault that the storm has come upon you. Now, I know at this point, a lot of preachers have made the argument that that Jonah is still in rebellion. And I'm not saying he's come fully out of it, but I don't want you to miss the beauty in this. What was Jonah struggling with that led him to run in the first place? Compassion. Compassion. He lacked compassion for a cruel nation in in his mind that didn't deserve God's mercy. But listen to me. Sometimes when you're struggling with the big step, God will let you warm up with a baby step. He'll give you a way to get there. Hey, Jonah, okay, so you're struggling having compassion for an entire nation. Then let's try a boat of sailors. How about that? Let's warm up with that. What about them? Do you, you willing to let them go down? Are you? Are you willing to let them die because you're having a temper tantrum? What's it going to be, Jonah? Your move. Do you see the change? Look at him. Jonah is willing to give his life to save the sailors even though he had refused to do the same for the people of Nineveh. Mm. That's because you have two options when God sends a storm. You can fight it or you can submit to it. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. (laughs) But they couldn't because the sea just grew even wilder than before. Look at this. Instead of just tossing Jonah overboard, the sailors show compassion to him by trying to row their way back to shore. Listen to me. There should not be an organization on this planet that is more compassionate than Christ's church. Period. Jonah refuses to warn the Ninevites, but some pagan sailors do everything in their power to try to save Jonah? I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine prophet Jonah is very convicted by that. Like, look how quick, Jonah, look how quick they are to jump to your aid and look how quick you were to run. Let me ask you something today. Do you stand out from the unbelievers in your life at all? Do you look different? at all see do they know you're a Christian because you say you are or do they respect your faith because you live it I mean it's nice that the sailors didn't want Jonah to die but unfortunately for them they're now in a rowing contest against God never a great position to be in (laughs) but it's like Jonah what are you doing speak up let them know this isn't going to work you just tried it no one should know better than you like, 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 let them know that when God is looking to help you course correct, you don't just get to row away. Man. This right here, this is part of the role of a veteran believer. And we don't see this enough in the local church, folks. Part of the role of a veteran believer is to look out for the younger crowd, to check in on them, to show concern for them. You know you can't run. <laughs> right? You know you can't run. You've learned that lesson over and over again. So share some wisdom. You should be screaming from the side of the boat, stop rowing. So in verse 14, they stop fighting and they start praying. They cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and it threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. So how do you know if you're the problem? If they get rid of you and everything's okay, you're the problem. It says they threw him into the water and immediately the water calms. Verse 16 is probably one of the coolest verses in the entire book. Check it out. 
At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. It's just a fancy Old Testament way of saying a bunch of sailors got saved that day. That's good. The preacher that refused to preach repentance led sailors to salvation, and he doesn't even know it. He's off floating somewhere in the Mediterranean. <laughs> it wasn't some well-planned church service. It wasn't some perfectly articulated sermon by a gifted speaker and communicator. It wasn't even a perfectly executed hymn or song. There was no altar call, no baptism, just some sailors that said yes to God because a rebellious preacher said no. Two things that we can't miss today. Number one, God can do it with or without you. He don't need your help. Second, God is able to take our mistakes and still help others find him. Your mistakes can be used by God for God's glory. But let's just break those two down because... It's important for us to understand. Uh, in fact, Paul says in Romans 12, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. It's not rocket science. Like if you spend your time elevating yourself, God will spend his time bringing you low. If you spend your time lowering yourself, God will one day lift you up. But see, here's the trick. It ultimately comes down to faith. If you don't believe God will lift you up, then you'll fight and jockey for position because if you don't fight for you, then who will? But if you believe that God will lift you up and you believe that that leads to a day when you will stand before him and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant whom I love, then there is no limit to how low you are willing to go when you're still here. Think about it. If you were trying to get to Glendale for a Cardinals game, does anybody go to those anymore? I don't know. I don't know. This is just, for some reason, you're crazy enough to go to a Cardinals game. What would you do if the freeway was closed? I'd probably just go home. But some of you, you, you what would you do? You'd take side streets, right, to get there. You have options, is my point. If you're closed off to God's plan, he's got options. God doesn't need you to do what he intends to do. He doesn't need you. The question isn't, can God do it without you? He most certainly can. The question is, why would you want to do it without God? Why? The second thing we can't miss here is that God can use our mistakes to help others find him. Praise God for that. And there's only one person that needed to be perfect, and it's because he knew you couldn't be. Right? So perfection isn't the aim anyways. Like this mask-wearing Christian culture drives me absolutely insane. Stop pretending like everything's okay. It's, it's okay to not be okay. It's fine. In fact, did you know God specializes in dealing with people that are not okay? That's why he sent his son Jesus, because he knew we were not okay. Far from it. And praise God that Jesus did everything right that Jonah did wrong. Jonah ran from his enemies and refused to warn them. But Jesus ran towards his enemies and warned them even though they threatened to kill him. Jonah, he refused the mission because of his hatred for the people. But Jesus, he accepted the mission because of his love for the people. Jonah endangered others because he was selfish, but Jesus endangered himself because he was selfless. Like Jonah isn't the only one that is being offered a second chance. Folks, you can have one too. Because the one greater than Jonah came and he was thrown into the ocean of God's wrath and he was tossed into the storm of God's fury except not some well-meaning fish didn't come swallow him up and then spit him out on the beach. No one saved Jesus. No one. He just sank. He did it to demonstrate God's love for us that we could know him. You might get hit with some waves. You might get pummeled from time to time and be going side to side on your smooth little sailing life. But if Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will never drown because he drowned for you. 
you're not going down. James 4 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. <laughs> Man, I found such hope in that this week. See, here's the thing about God. You can't run from him because he's omnipresent. Hello, big church word. All right? Basically, he's present all places, all times. His omnipresence makes it impossible to run from him. Don't play tag with God. You're going to lose. But here's what's great about the omnipresence. It makes it really easy to stop and reconnect with him. <laughs> Open his word. Get into the word. Dive in. Get to know him. If you don't have a Bible, I'll get one for you. We have plenty. Commit to worship with us every week. Yes, I said it. Look, if you want to intermittent fast because you want to drop a few, fine. But can we just please stop the intermittent worship? It's not good for you. Every week, come worship with us. Kickstart your prayer life. Stop rowing against him and call out to him. Cry out to him. Because Jesus had to die for you because you were saying no to God. Your rebellion, it put you in a situation where you were going to have to go overboard. And in an unexpected turn of events, Jesus jumped for you. Like seeing how he loves us, it changes us. He was willing to die for me to save me. So I'm willing to live for him. Are you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, truth is we're all in Jonah's shoes in what feels like almost every day. And we have the choice to turn our back on you and grab the first ship out of here or just stop and listen. Stop and obey. Stop and seek your will, not ours. Seems like we're faced with this choice daily. Lord, I understand the spiritual warfare involved in being a Christian. I understand the battle that we are in. And the temptation could be to think, hey, the ship is ready, then God's in this. All the while, you're going the wrong way. Lord, would you give us the discernment to know which way to go? Would you lead us? Would you direct us? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dealing with our sin. We couldn't. You did. And that's why we sing to you. That's why we praise you because you are worthy. Your salvation is sweet, Lord. Thank you. It's in your name we pray.